you're trying to get started again at the lodge, and yeah. I don't know what all. Yeah. Yeah. Fitness. Fitness. Yeah, could have gone Where the right page now? They came out with a line dancing for October 7th of 14th. I was one of the first to sign my name up. <laughs> it's going to be in that outside parking lot to the far right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got it on now. It's yeah. just coming. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. good. So, is this a good position? Did I, did I delete it correctly from your apparel's page? I didn't see You're it. You're in there, position. So. I see okay. it. Floyd's sitting there. It's a good position. Okay. So if I'm leaning in, it's not a, not blocking too much. No, no, no okay. it's actually good because it gets the screen nice and I squared see the screen up. Really and, well okay. And the, uh, and well, the time there is then good. I have six thirty, and I will yield the chair to the representative oh, from right. Sun City. Oh, Freaking out here. All right. Okay. Starting on Sunday morning, she'll get it going on her. I'll get it on my own. Turn up on TV. It's about five seconds. Yo. Yeah. You know, so so then I have, she to, has to turn hers off when we get started. I have to shut it down because it that confuses me. <laughs> yeah, I shut it down. I just go to the scripture then and watch on the screen. All right, yeah. we got six thirty. Yep. All right. Hey, uh, good evening, everybody. Glad you are here on uh, Thursday night. And for those of you watching on YouTube, as we post this on YouTube afterwards. Uh, glad you uh, have an opportunity to see this as well, and that uh, you, and again, feel free to share these with uh, friends, family, view, review, um, as, as you need. Just good tools uh, while we're all kind of locked away here. Uh, Sunday morning, David's, uh, David's lesson is already up for Sunday morning in Revelation. If you're, uh, if you're on that YouTube uh, channel there, it's already posted there. Uh, David won't be with us this weekend. He has a wedding he has to go to. So he won't be joining us on uh, on Facebook, but the uh, but the lesson is already posted to the YouTube site. Uh, next Sunday evening, a week from this Sunday, we will have the uh, Jim and Marsha Roundtree. We'll be playing again that first uh, first Sunday evening in October, but we're moving it to five o'clock rather than six thirty because as as uh, seven fifteen rolled around the other day, it got pretty dark, and uh, and it's interesting because we went from putting the curtains down to block the sun because it was so hot to putting the curtains down to block the wind a little bit because it was so cold and it just sort of happened you know, it just happened really quickly but we had a really good crowd uh, last Sunday evening but we are going to move it to five o'clock and go from five o'clock to six o'clock and then just go for as long as we can until it just gets so uncomfortably cold that it just isn't reasonable to do that anymore. Uh, Wednesday morning, the men's Zoom meeting. We had a good group of guys uh, this uh, uh, this uh, last Wednesday morning as well. With um, you know, joining uh, Wayne Fisher joining us from Texas and Will McGraw up in Vermont as as people are distanced. So one nice thing about you know the guy from Texas and the guy from Vermont can't join us if we're meeting over at La Peep. So this was this is really um, you know just a. You know, this is working out well in, in some regards. And if you would, too, go back and look at the email about Barry Crone and the Kairos uh, Prison Ministry, the Cookie Ministry, uh, that, uh, that ALC and, uh, and Bible Study Club. Uh, just if you feel like making cookies and, and uh, getting them over to Barry Crone, uh, the, the email is there with all the instructions there. So, again, thanks for being here, and I will uh, turn this over to Floyd. To open it. Well, good evening. It's good to have you here again today. Can you believe it's September 24th? Matter of fact, I was looking ahead to what next Thursday is going to be, and it's going to be October the 1st. Now, that's just hard to believe. We'll, we'll be into October this time next Thursday. A lot can happen in a week uh, as, as we pray together. Let's pray for one another and all the things that are going on in, um, in your life, the lives of those in our Bible study club, uh, folks that you may know in your neighborhood. You might want to pray for them as I pray. Uh, one of our new, newer move-ins was a, a neighbor of uh, David and Barbara Kirby uh, there on Kingfisher and um, moved up from Florida not even a year ago. And the uh, Grinnell family, uh, Michael and Sheila, and Michael 
uh, has had many difficulties, but you know, last Wednesday night he had a fall, and by Thursday evening he had passed away from complications. So uh, pray for Sheila, Sheila Grinnell, as uh, she's uh, dealing with all of those things and lots of other little things going on in the family life. And we had a kind of a small family memorial at their home on the on the back uh, porch. A uh, nice open area, uh, plenty of space, about 10, 12 people there. But you want to pray for them and pray for them, as uh, especially for Sheila, as she tries to make all those adjustments that any um, widow or widower would have to do after a spouse has passed. So we're going to be getting into our text today. We're going to start a new chapter. We'll talk about that in a minute. But why don't we just pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you once again for Jesus Christ who makes even our, our, our coming together possible. Thank you, Lord, that we have um, met each other at the foot of Calvary. Those of us who know you as Savior, we have come to you for salvation. And in that um, meeting, we have met many others who know you. We thank you, Lord, for everyone who is a companion of those that love God. Thank you, Lord, for those here in Sun City who come from different places in our country as well as in the world, and they're living here with us. I pray that you would uh, bless us as a Bible study group to be able to minister, reach out, make friends in our neighborhoods, and uh, be the salt and light and be the, the blessing that we can be as your people to those that are around us. We ask, Lord, for a special help tonight to understand your word. We're getting into a very difficult passage and we just ask that you would give us illumination, give us uh, clarity, help me to be clear in explanation. I pray, Father, that we would all be able to think clearly and understand what Peter was trying to tell that first century church and how those things might apply to our 21st century church. We just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to begin chapter 2 of Peter. I'm calling this entire chapter Danger in the Last Days, and we have a, we're going to divide it into two parts. Part one is tonight, payday someday. Uh, a little bit more about judgment, and then next week, telltale signs of the false teachers. And so we'll, we'll see uh, what Peter had to say uh, to the young church about them. Now, when you get the big idea of Second Peter, where I'm going to try to help you get the big picture, put all, put the frame around it, and then we'll start coloring by the numbers to fill in the gaps if we can, and that'll help us understand these little details and why Peter says the things that he says. But the big idea, to use a Howard Hendricks phrase, the big idea of Second Peter, some people might call it the purpose of Second Peter, is something like this calling all Christians to spiritual growth so that, so that they may stay on track while they await the coming of Christ. Now, what we've captured in that idea is the, a lot of things that are happening in the text that point to why we need to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We saw in chapter 1 those ideas about adding to our faith all of those supplements of the virtues, seven virtues. And then we saw last week how that the, Peter was telling us that the word of God from the Old Testament prophecies was confirmed even more fully to us at the transfiguration. In chapter 2, we're going to see, but not everybody agrees with that. There are a lot of people coming down the pike that are false teachers. you got to stay on track. you got to beware of them. And why? Because the Lord is coming in chapter 3. And uh, uh, we want to make sure that we are ready for that. So in effect, the three lines that I have there uh, sort of loosely apply to the three chapters that are in Second Peter. Calling all Christians to spiritual growth, <clears throat> chapter 1. So that they may stay on track, chapter 2, not get blown off track. While they await the coming of Christ, especially in chapter 3. Well, that gives us an orientation now, remember last week when he told us that he wanted to remind us that he is going to leave us some reminders and he's going to do his best to make sure that we can recall 
And what he did is he wrote us a book. And God used Peter to write those words down. And if God takes that kind of time through his, his servants to give us his word, then we need to read and heed that word. In the Old Testament prophecies about Messiah, those were more fully confirmed to us by eyewitness accounts, Peter said. He was there, James was there, John was there. They saw Moses and Elijah. Jesus transformed just as bright as Revelation 1 describes him. And there was an investiture. This is the king. This is what the law and the prophets pointed forward to. This is the Messiah. We believe it. The Lord gave the voice from heaven to confirm it. And he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And Peter says, this is a prophecy of the Old Testament more fully confirmed to us today. And that's part of our basis for certainty. But then he goes on and he says, it's not just what we saw, not just what we heard, but in all the scriptures. You see, scripture, according to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God. And even the ESV says all scripture is God breathed. It is breathed out from God. He's the source of of that, And that's what gives us a basis for certainty. Yes, he uses uh, uh, human servants to write it down. But then in Second Peter, what we saw last week is that God has delivered this breathed out scripture through chosen servants carried along by the Holy Spirit. So between Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 and, and in uh, Second Peter chapter 1 verse uh, 21, we have the texts that are telling us what the scriptures are, where they came from, from God, and how we got them in the form we got them, men carried along by the Holy Spirit. So without destroying their personalities, because Luke writes differently than James, James writes differently than Paul or Peter or Matthew, and there are differences as you can see, but it's all God's word, and he so superintends those words as these, these servants were carried along by the Spirit, born along. It isn't dictation, but it is certainly a process. It's a very special process. It gives us assurance, it gives us a basis for our certainty. Having said that, you might ask, well, what is Peter doing? Why is he spending so much time giving us this basis? It's because he knows, and this is why he wants to give them a second helping, he knows that there are some troubling times coming. Previewing Second Peter chapter 2, then I want, to, want you to see the, the, the big blocks that Peter is going to give us. The warning regarding the coming of false teachers. Coming false teachers, chap, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And then there is assured judgment on those false teachers. Chapter 2, verses 4 to 10a. Now, we're going to look at those two pieces tonight. And then next week, we'll see some more specifics about false teachers. Now, what we're going to see is that Peter addresses their character, their conduct, and their condemnation. He tells us something about the person himself. He tells us this is how they operate and because of who they are, because of, of what they're doing and not knowing the Lord and trying to lead the true sheep away and astray, they've got great condemnation. So that's what this chapter is all about. So let's get into it and see what we can see as we get into this, this first segment here. Second Peter chapter 2, verse, verse 1 tells us, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Now, as I said, this is going to be a difficult chapter, and every verse is packed. It's tightly woven. <laughs> Matter of fact, once we get through this introductory verses 1 to 3 about these, these, these false teachers, their 
character, conduct, and condemnation, he's, Peter's going to launch into one big, long sentence from verse 4 down to 10a. One long sentence. I can't imagine what it might have been like for those who first just heard it read to them. We, with our English translations, you know, we're so much more educated than those first century people. And we don't need, we don't understand those big old long sentences. So we have to have it broken down in small languages, sentences in our new English translations. But the what you have here is in verses 4 to, four to 10, as we're going to see, it's a very compact uh, uh, presentation. Look what he says here. He's making a contrast, but false prophets also arose among the people. Remember, in the end of chapter 1, he's talking about that Old Testament prophecy that was confirmed more fully to us. So he is now giving us an illustration. Just like in the Old Testament, there were false prophets that arose among the people of God, right along with those true prophets. So Peter tells them, there will also be false teachers among you, the people of God now. Just like they were false prophets, there's going to be false teachers. Now, he's not saying that they're going to claim to be prophets. They're going to bring in and sneak in twisted doctrines, doctrines that are going to be secretly, secretly brought in, destructive heresies. It's very interesting that whole idea of secretly brought in, it's surreptitiously. It's, it's like, uh, it could be, it could be uh, taken in two different ways. This idea of actually truly brought in secretly, almost like Galatians chapter 2 verse 4, where there were people who, according to Paul, entered in, and he uses the very same verb, they entered in secretly so they could spy out our liberty we have in Christ and try to entrap those that really weren't founded in the word so they could get them to come back to the law works. That secretly working their way in. That is that is a, a easily a possible translation. And so we have here who will secretly bring in. But also, it's an interesting sidelight. The, the word is also used for what is brought in alongside of. Now, maybe you never have done this, but have you ever been in a place where maybe you know, you really didn't have the ticket to get in back there when you were a teenager. And, and so there's a whole crowd of people crowding to get in the door and you didn't have a ticket. So you just sort of came right up alongside of them on the outside and kind of snuck right in there with them. That brought in alongside of. The true doctrine is there and these guys have brought in these other teachings alongside of what is true and trying to twist and distort secretly bringing in, and what they bring in, according to Peter, are in fact destructive heresies. Now the whole idea of what is destructive is that they are going to divide the people. Heresy is not quite, by the time Peter writes this in the first century, the use of heresy is not exactly the way we think of it, you know, false doctrine. Yes, it, it is headed in that direction, but the, the idea of heresies is parties. It's division, so we have this party and that party and this other party. And, and in these divisions, then their own special set of ideas come out that we hold to this and we hold to that and we hold to the other thing. And so what he is saying that these false teachers, when they sneak in with their other ideas, they begin to draw aside make divisions and draw aside people and teach them their way. And then if it weren't for good elders in the churches, they would have a, a group of people that would be almost like a cancer within the body. And so Peter's warning all, and especially I would even think the elders, that you have to be careful for people who come in and try to sound like they're with us to start with, but sooner or later it becomes evident that they have a different agenda and a different set of truths they claim that are true. There are no such things as, as alternate truths. Uh, the destructive heresies, and one of those is very deadly. Even denying the master who bought them. Wow! The master who bought them. That word master is used about ten times in the New Testament. 
It's used four times here in the, these, these little epistles at the end of our New Testament. James and James, or Jude rather, in Jude 4, he says, the, our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. And it's in the very same context that Peter's writing here. And I say that they are denying Jesus, the person, that he is in fact the sovereign Lord, and they're denying his work, that he redeemed them. Peter is saying the very Lord who in fact died for them, they're denying him and they're denying what he has done for them. Now this is significant because for me it does point to the fact that uh, the Lord Jesus, when he died, he died for Adam's fallen race. I don't think he died just for a certain number. He died for all of those who were fallen in Adam. And then he has opened the gates for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And that world, as John uses, it, it uses that word world, is the world of those who in fact are God's enemies. And these heretics, these false teachers, are actually denying the very Lord that bought them. What a horrible thought, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Let me show you this passage in 1 John chapter 2. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if any man does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation, the sacrifice that turns away the wrath of God. He is the propitiation for our sins, John's writing to this church, and not for ours only, but for also the sins of the whole world. Do you see that word, whole world? Watch how John uses that in chapter 5, verse 19. We know that we are from God and the whole world. Very same phrase. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. You see, this whole world is the world that's hostile against God. And that's the world that the Lord loved, sent his son to die for. And these false teachers are so arrogant and emboldened, they deny that Jesus is the sovereign Lord, and they deny his work for them. As if you had something else that you needed to do. Remember, the whole world lies under the power of the evil one, and the Lord wants us to trust him. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So when Peter says, even denying the, the master who bought them, that is the word redeemed, by the way, the master who bought them, re bringing upon themselves swift destruction, he begins to inject that notion of these ones who are false teachers are not believers and they in fact are going to be headed for destruction. That's the condemnation. Let's see how he continues to word that in verses 2 and 3. In verse 2 he says, and many will follow their sensuality. Just their, their lust to just run amok. Because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. Now, unfortunately, that first phrase, many will follow their sensuality, I, I'm afraid that that could include some who really are believers, but ungrounded in the early church. They might be led astray, but the false teachers definitely are headed for destruction. And we'll come back to that as we get deeper in the text, especially next week. But many will follow their sensuality because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. Because of this false teaching and especially this, this unfortunate combining liberty, we are free in Christ. And then suddenly this freedom in Christ is freedom to do many sensual things that the scriptures have told us not to do. Uh, people are going to say, well, that's what I thought there was a dark underbelly to Christianity. And now I know. You know, there are two levels here we want to distinguish. There are those who are truly unbelieving false teachers whose pitch is freedom, whose pitch is follow me and you'll, you'll get into the depths of God. 
follow me and you'll really understand how life works. But their pitch is on a greedy, sensual basis. That's one thing. Unfortunately, some that get sucked in and some that cause the way of truth to be blasphemed are believers. And whether they be pastors of megachurches or whether they be presidents of large Christian universities, whether they be presidents of the Evangelical Theological Society. It doesn't matter. It still causes the way of truth to be blasphemed. Whenever someone follows and yields to that sensual draw, then the truth is besmudged. And people who don't know the Lord are emboldened to say, ah, I always knew it was a bunch of phonies in there. And you know what? When David sinned with Bathsheba, Nathan was sent back to David and he said, because of your sin, you've given the enemies of the Lord great occasion to blaspheme. Use the same idea. Now David was a believer. David repented, we know. But you know what? It still gives the enemies of the Lord great occasion to blaspheme. Our text is specifically, at least in this first part, down to verse 10, speaking to those who are false teachers and unbelieving teachers. And he says in verse 3, And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Do you see the sensuality and the greed? The come on with freedom when really is sexual freedom? Or they have another agenda? And greed because really they have a profit motive? Interestingly, this notion of uh, they will exploit you with false words, this whole idea of exploiting, that word is the word that we get emporium from. I remember as a little boy, I guess there's not a whole lot of downtown emporiums anymore, going to Sears. Do you remember Sears? And going to Sears as a little boy and walking into the emporium to get to other little shops and then into the Sears big store. And there in the Emporium, all oh, the popcorn. Those little red and white boxes, you remember that? And the popcorn, oh, just waft. I used to love to go down there with mom and dad because they were popcorn addicts. And when they smelled that popcorn, I could always pull on them and say, hey, you know what, why don't we get us some popcorn? And they would say, okay, let's get some. <laughs> now that's Emporium. It's to make merchandise of. That's the idea of the word. And these false teachers are so greedy, they want to make merchandise of believers. And the first church, the early church, Peter is warning them, be careful. There's a lot of bad guys out there. There's a lot of wolves out there. And they will exploit you with false words. These are fabricated words. These are ideas that in fact are plastic Actually, that's where our word plastic comes from, is from that Greek word that's false right there. These are words that are fabricated, words that are in fact put together in a way that sound really cool and sound really plausible, but in fact, they're intended because of their greed, they're intended to make merchandise of you. Come on in. Don't I have a place at my table for you? You got to be careful. Warren Wearsby put it this way. They use our vocabulary but they don't, do not use our dictionary. I like that. You see, they use the words of Christ and freedom and love, but they have a little different dictionary definition than our definitions of what those ideas mean. And so they exploit you with false words. One of the early church fathers, Irenaeus, back in, well, he was martyred in 202, but back at the end of the second century, he, he wrote this down, and it shows you how very rampant this whole notion of false teachers was. Irenaeus said this, Error, indeed, is never set forth in its naked deformity, lest, being thus exposed, it should at once be detected. But it is craftily decked out in an attractive dress, so as by its outward form to make it appear to the unexperienced more true than truth itself. More true than truth itself. 
hey, these early church fathers, they saw what Peter was talking about that was coming. And don't think that it isn't happening right today in Charlotte metroplex area. There are false teachers who are exploiting God's people and their motives are sensual and greedy. And they may use our words, but they don't use our dictionary. And so Peter goes on to say, their condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. Now, what he's again getting us ready for is in verses 4 to 10, he's going to talk about why condemnation is on its way and why destruction. Just like condemnation, destruction on people in the past, and he's going to give us illustrations of in the past, how God brought judgment, he says that same kind of condemnation is not nodding off. It's not dozing. God's not sleepy. He knows, and he will judge in his time. See, that's what he's telling us. Well, let's see if we can wrap up some of these ideas before we get into our second part. Summary of ideas out of 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Did you notice the men with their methods? Forewarned about their secret intro. This is how they like to come in. They may come in with what looks like good intentions, but their intentions are to just draw people to themselves. Oh, I've had people join churches where I was pastoring, and I thought, wow, this is great, man, to have this businessman join my church. And all he wanted to do was have more business contacts. That's the only reason he was there. And it got to be a little bit uh, sticky sometimes until they had to be confronted by a couple of our elders. Shameful greed, exploitation. This is the kind of people that like to saddle up. My dad used to call it sidle up. I don't know what the sidle up. Come alongside, sidle up to those guys. They come up to us and they want to get in into our crowd. The meaning of their misunderstanding is specifically it's, re, it's referring to Christ. They deny the uniqueness of Christ and his redemption. But that's at the heart, friends and neighbors. That's at the heart. If you deny Christ, that he's the savior, that he is the unique one sent by God into this world to be the savior of Adam's fallen race and that what he did is valid for those who will just believe it, well then, you know what? We are we're, we're really attacking the heart to what it means to be a Christian. And then just a little bit, meditate on the mess. Did you notice through that passage, the mess for our meditation? The impact on others, they get, some are exploited. Some are, they, they follow along. And, and so there's an infection that draws off, unfortunately, many weak Christians. But then there's also an impact on themselves. They'll bring upon themselves swift destruction. And so Peter tells us and warns us, this is the kind of people you got to be careful for. Now he laid the foundation in chapter one. Make sure you know why we have certain truths about who Jesus is and what he's come to do. This is why you need to grow in grace. Why? Because in chapter two, there's going to be some false teachers come down the pike. Now he's going to get into a little more of an explanation. As we mentioned, there's the, the character of these teachers, their conduct, and their condemnation. And now in the second part, which we're going to look at tonight, next week, the third part, the second part is going to deal more with the, the, the um, uh, condemnation of these guys. And then next week, we'll look at their character uh, and their uh, conduct a little more, how they operate. So let's go on. This long sentence in the Greek, uh, Greek Bible. Verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 4. I'm going to highlight the if clauses because this is, it's a con big old long conditional clause. That is, if, then. But you don't find a then until you get down to the bottom. So what you've got are four ifs. Now watch what it happens. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Did you see that? 
Now he's alluding back to God's judgment on angels that sinned. He's cast into hell. The word for hell is not the common word for hell. Matter of fact, this word for hell is Tartarus. Tartarus. And some people uh, uh, wondered about that word because it looks like a rather than Sheol in the Old Testament and Hades in the New Testament, translated hell quite often. Uh, this is the only time this word occurs in our Bible, Tartarus or Tartarus. Now, Tartarus itself, Tartarus refers to a subterranean abyss. I could say it's kind of a death row. Since gloom and doom is certain, but it's not carried out yet. That's the idea. And apparently, and this goes along with what David was has been teaching us as we got into that uh, preview for Revelation and Daniel. You remember the, the, uh, the spiritual warfare that we're in? He goes back to Genesis 6, teach, Pastor David did, and he goes back to Genesis 6 and talks about how that it looks like angels invaded the human race and there was some, some unfortunate uh, relationships that went on that caused some creepy things to happen. And Peter may be referring to that. He did not spare the angels when they sinned. See, not all the angels sinned in Genesis 6, but those who did were cast down into Tartarus, into hell. And this is why that one demon, when, when the, the Lord uh, was talking to that one fellow that had those legion of demons in him, and they said, don't send us to the abyss. The demon speaking through that demoniac man, so controlled that his personality is, is warped, but his strength was immense, breaking the chains. And Jesus met him and he cowered like a little puppy in front of him. And they cried out, don't send us to the abyss. See, this is the idea. And Jesus said, you can go to the hogs. <laughs> So I guess rather than go to hell, you can go to the hogs. And they went and, and they went into the hogs and it caused them to spook and they all ran and over a cliff and like lemmings and, and died. Well, this could very well be that kind of an event. Chains of gloom. This is not that there are literal chains, but it's like so, so despairing, so uh, uh, foreboding. Judgment is coming. And they know it. And they know it. Now, if God didn't spare the angels that sinned, they're undergoing some judgment even right now. One day there's going to be even more. You see, if God can find angels, first if, verse 4, let's go on to verse 5. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserve Noah. Now we're talking about Noah's day again, you see. And Noah, a herald of righteousness, you know, that really doesn't ever say that in the Old Testament in Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9. Doesn't ever say that it's a herald of righteousness. But, but that was something that was, in fact, apparently captured from uh, intertestamental Jewish tradition. And Peter said, you know, that's still true. And God inspired it and put it in our scriptures. He was a preacher of righteousness, a herald of righteousness. And it says here in our text, with seven others. That's funny that the ESV does that. It really just says Noah the eighth. Now, I don't know if that means the eighth person to go into the ark because Noah got all of his family, seven others, and then Noah is the last one to go in and God shut and sealed the door. But you know what? It says if God didn't spare that ancient world because of their, their uh, violence, their immorality, every thought of their heart was only evil continually. If God didn't spare them, do you think he's going to spare these false teachers? See, that's the idea. When he brought upon them, the, brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly. God has brought judgment. If God can find the angels, verse 4, and if God overthrew the ancient world, verse 5, let's go on, verse 6, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. Wow, another if. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Wow. It says here that he turned them to ashes. That 
phrase is the very phrase that was used in first century Greek, A.D. 79, writing about Pompeii when Mount Vesuvius erupted and destroyed it. That's the word. Turn them to ashes. Same idea, Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says he condemned them to extinction, making an example, an example. This example stands even to this day. God has judged in the past, and you don't think he can judge in the future? He will judge in the future, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. I know that's not a very popular theme to talk about, God's judgment to come, but that's what Peter is warning the first church about. Now, if God reduced to ashes Sodom and Gomorrah, okay, let's go back and wrap up, see what we got here a little bit about Sodom and Gomorrah. I just wanted to toss this verse in. This was extra. I didn't even get it to Bob in time, but I want you to see this one verse, Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49 about Sodom and Gomorrah. Because what we sometimes in our mind, we think it's just because of their homosexuality. That's only part of the immorality. But look at the sin that Ezekiel, when Jerusalem has been destroyed and Ezekiel's led, led in captivity over to Babylon, and he writes and he says, Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom, talking to Judah. You're worse, he says to Judah. <laughs> And he says, your sister Sodom, this was her guilt. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. That's the guilt, primary guilt of Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you think the United States of America is going to escape? Well, enough said. There, these were the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so when we follow this thread through our passage, if God confined the angels, if God overthrew the ancient world, if God reduced to ashes Sodom and Gomorrah, all right, let's take another step. Verses seven and eight. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. Now, it does call Lot righteous. He was, he was in, he knew the Lord. Oh, he made some bad choices. And those bad choices had the ripple effect of implications on his family. He made the choices for better business, better pastures, more money. I can sell more cattle down in Sodom and Gomorrah than I can up here. You know, he, he, he made some bad choices, but he still, in his heart, he was a, a righteous one. He was inclined towards God. He was greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. I'm not saying that Sodom wasn't sensual. It was very sensual. And then he even adds a little parenthesis explanation for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Not a pretty picture, not a pretty place to live. But if God was able to rescue Lot, now let's put that together. If God confined angels, if God overthrew the ancient world, if God reduced to ashes Sodom and Gomorrah, if God rescued Lot, now verse 9 and 10, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Their greed, their, their quote, freedom, makes them resist anyone who thinks they can tell me what to do. Despise authority. Well, if God has judged in the past, Peter's telling the church, two things you want to remember, okay? Two things you want to remember. If God confined angels, if God overthrew the ancient world, if God reduced to ashes Sodom and Gomorrah, if God rescued Lot, then God knows how to, he knows how to rescue the godly from trials. And just like he rescued Noah and his family, just like he rescued Lot and his family, but his wife turned 
away and only his two daughters were, were saved. Just like God is able to rescue, he'll rescue you too. You see, in the context of this chapter 3, when we get there, is the day of the Lord. And he will be able to rescue us from the day of the Lord. God will bring judgment, but he will rescue those who belong to him. But then he also is able to keep the unrighteous under punishment. It's like they're already continuing in a intermediate state punishment, and he knows how to bring it to its rightful end. It's almost like that Romans 1 where the Lord gave up the sensual world and he gave up and he gave them up, and it says he gives them up three different times to their own sensuality, and they take they they end up suffering in themselves the results of their own and own sins and depravity. See, that's just the beginning. Wait till God really judges. So God knows. Well, let's wrap it up. Principles of judgment. Not a pretty picture, is it? But remember this. It's the same God of compassion that's the God of judgment. It's the same God. The God that didn't spare his own son. That's the very same word. It's God did not spare the angels that sinned, and he didn't spare the ancient world. But in Romans 8.32, God did not spare his own son. He gave him up for us. Compassionate God. Well, you reject his compassion in Christ Jesus, and you'll find out that he's also a God of judgment. Why? Because we have to balance love and righteousness. See, that's, that's, that's God. Its attributes are equally coextensive and together in the one God. Principle of judgment, same God. And remember the already and the not yet, now and later. The Lord's holding those angels in that gloomy Tartarus who sinned in Genesis 6, but they're going to be judged forever one day when they're thrown into the lake of fire. Remember, hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for humans, but when humans side with Satan and his kingdom plan, and not God and his kingdom plan, well, then they will suffer the judgment. And so already, like in Noah's day, people suffered. Already in Sodom and Gomorrah, people suffered. But not yet will we see the final. Later on, there'll be the culmination of that judgment. And then another principle of judgment is its certainty. If God does this, if God does that, if God does this, one, two, three, four, then, then, then you better believe that God is able. He is able to rescue. That's the good side, right? He's able to rescue us from that judgment when we throw ourselves on his mercy. But you know what? He's able to hold judgment and he demonstra that's demonstrated from his track record in history. That's why he walked through the angels that sinned, and then Noah and the flood, and Sodom and Gomorrah, and this whole issue of Noah's flood and judgment and Sodom and Gomorrah. Those are the two things that Jesus brings up more than once, especially like in Luke 17. And those two notions Jesus brings up, it'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah then in the day of judgment than for some even living in Jesus' day. And so we want to make sure that we know that there is a God who loves us, but there's also a God who will hold us accountable. Applications for the good guys from the bad guys, all right? Applications. False teaching appears successful and happy, but it has another unwritten agenda of exploitation and greed. Tolerance of expression. Yes, we can tolerate, we, that's our country, we tolerate people saying whatever they want to say and believe. But does that mean it's equally true because we equally give people a right to speak? No, it's not equally true. Some things are really poisonous. And remember from our passage, it, it shows that demonic power is restricted, just like it was restricted in the day of Noah. 
it is restricted. And so we are not just walking around in a world full of zombies and demons. No, not at all. We have the power of God. We have the spirit living in us. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. The righteous should be distressed over sin. Could I encourage you to remember that especially? Sometimes we grow, I'm afraid, jaded because of what we watch on TV, because of what we see in the movies, and we're not distressed over the violence and the sin that's in our culture. We should be like Lot and be distressed. There will be a payday someday. Don't ever forget it. There will be a payday someday. Now, remember, let's not make an idol out of tolerance. I'm saying this because of our present distress in our country. We respect the right of each one to believe whatever he or she wants to believe. But that is not to be confused with whatever anyone believes is right. It's not true. Some ideas are poisonous and some ideas are dangerous. Thank God we live in a country where we have freedom of expression, freedom of speech. But everything that is freely spoken is not necessarily equally right and true. We have to be careful, just like Peter was, was warning the early church, beware of those false teachers. It's dangerous to your spiritual health. And with that, I'm going to conclude with a warning. Remember how at first when it came out on the packs of cigarettes, and then we've seen it in other things. Warning, I'm going to say this. The Savior General has concluded that false teaching will be hazard to your spiritual health. And that is true. And I pray that God will help you to read God's word and heed God's word and grow in grace so that you will not be led astray by these false teachers that are out there in the world. But we'll see you next week. Next time, October 1, can you believe? Danger in the Last Days, Part 2, Telltale Signs of False Teachers. And we'll see you some more next week. God bless you.